Vice Chair Scholl? Here. And Chair Olmstead Bowen? Here. Okay. Item until the motion is made and passed, and we moved on to another item. 
Uh, we want to make sure that we have one um, committee member on the floor at a time, so that way everybody has equal time, they are heard, and they are understood by not only the committee members themselves, but also the community. Um, of course, debate is always allowed on all motions. We had a few this last committee meeting, which was nice to see. And uh, make sure each of you are speaking up if you feel you have more questions on a motion. If um, you don't agree with it, that's perfectly fine. Um, you need to do what you feel is right during that time and make sure that your voice is heard. The issue, not the person, is always what is under consideration. So the person making the motion, you're not judging it because this person or that person made the motion. You're judging the motion based on its merits pertaining to the item, if it is something you support or don't support. An item once decided cannot come back before the assembly in the same session. So that means if something is not passed or is passed, you can't um, vote again on that item. You can't remove it. Once the motion has been made and the vote has been passed, that item is complete. You would have to then ask for it to return at the next meeting in order for it to be reheard and re reviewed, and you would vote and make motions again on that point. Of course, the majority always, um, the majority vote always is the one that decides. Just some Brown Act basics. Um, all of our meetings are open to the public, and all um, persons shall be permitted to attend, <clears throat> unless there is something that's otherwise posted as a closed session. Excuse me. A congregation of the majority of members at the same time and location is not permitted, unless it is a scheduled meeting of the legislative body. So please don't call each other and say, let's meet at Starbucks, let's discuss what happened at the meeting yesterday, or Let's talk about some things coming up in the future. That is a, like a serial meeting, or is that that's a meeting that is not allowed by the Brown Act? Go ahead. Um, I just saw something, and I'm just asking a question here, where um, in Pomona, they were doing a Facebook kind of meeting, and they got admonished or whatever. Exactly. So this also, so, it, so this includes emails? Emails, social media, I was just, about to touch on that. The same thing happens with email. It's very easy to put everybody's name on or reply all and start having these conversations in an email. No, emails are for FYI only, no discussion. So if I send you the a council packet and then you all start reply all and you start talking about item 2B, what should we do, or I have questions on that, you're having a serial meeting. We don't want that to happen. So go ahead. You can speak one-to-one, -one, right? You can speak one-on-one, -on -one, and um, as long as there is not more than three of you together or four of you together, you can do one-on-one -on -one conversations. And also, if you're at a public <clears throat> gathering or a social event, as long as you're not discussing shop, not talking about the agenda or items on the agenda, you're fine to be there as a group. Um, just the same thing as touching on there's no discussion, deliberation, or taking action outside of a scheduled meeting or considering um, items on an upcoming meeting. So uh, you want to make sure that everything is um, saved, anything, questions, notes, anything you have, make sure you bring them and they're discussed here in an open forum in public. So that way we have no problems with the Brown Act and we don't become one of those cities that you hear about at training sessions that the city clerk goes to. <laughs> Meetings, regular meetings, just like we were having, those are those that are established consistent day and time. Like right now, we are established the fourth Wednesday of each month. I know originally uh, when the Measure R, I was reading back in some of the notes and on the bylaws, it was going to be quarterly. So that is something you can eventually move to if you choose, um, because that is in, your, is in your bylaws. A special meeting would be a different day and time other than your regular meeting. So um, if today you decided you want a meeting before the um, end of July, that would become a special meeting. And you would have to make that motion and you would have to vote on that. An adjourned meeting is the meeting that you're currently in, but then um, becomes continued. You couldn't finish the meeting for some specific re reasons. And, um, and it, that could be a continuation of a regular or a special meeting. Or you can also do study sessions, which are informal meetings where there is no action taken. It is just a presentation of information for yourself or for the community. Oh, thank you. 
presiding officer or the chairperson. Um, essential characteristics is knowledgeable about the basic procedures, which we are making sure everybody is today. Self-confidence, poise, fair, impartial, tactful, courteous, common sense, sense of humor is always good. So this not only for the presiding officer, but also each committee member um, should adhere to some of these too. Your chairperson's duties is opening the meeting at the appointed time, announce in proper sequence the items to come before the advisory uh, members, recognize members who are entitled to the floor, state to put in vote all questions that legit legitimately come before the group, protect the meeting from delay, making sure you're expediting the business, that we're not getting off track, enforce the rules of procedure, Authenticate when necessary all acts, orders, and proceedings. So just making sure that if you need to repeat a vote, you re need to have a um, repeat a motion, that that is done properly. And you would also, as a chairperson, declare the meeting adjourned. These are my always and nevers. These are just some little helpful tips to keep this all on track. We will always want to make sure we're maintaining order. We want to provide strong leadership, remain impartial, be tactful, be fair, keep discussion relevant to the items that are being heard, and exercise good judgment. Never get excited, never be unjust, be more technical than necessary, or allow remarks or debate to wander off on the subject. The recording officer or secretary, which is myself, I'm here to call the meeting to order in the absence of the chair or vice chair and presiding until chair pro tem is selected. At that point, calling the role as requested by the chair, having a general understanding of the governing rules, recording the minutes of each mini meeting, maintaining an attendance log, carrying out the administrative duties as necessary. These duties for this uh, meeting are undertaken by city staff members designated by the city manager, which is the city clerk myself. Our standard order of business is the agenda, which we will always call the order. We will do a roll call, pledge of allegiance, the business items, discussion items, public comments, items for future committee meetings, and then the adjournment. Our voting, um, voting begins with a motion. Any member may make a motion. When making a motion, you want to be clear and concise with I move to adopt, approve, recommend. Second, every motion requires a second, so the person making the second wants to begin with, I second the motion. If no second is made, the chair asks for a second. Since there is no second, the motion will not be considered. If a second is made, a verbal roll call vote is taken, and the city clerk restates the motion, the motion made by the member and the second member to approve and re um, review at that point. Verbal roll call is Roll call vote is taken, and the most the motion passes if the majority of the members present vote in favor. Other items, um, just a little bit of definition. You can um, abstain. You can abstain from a vote if you feel there's not enough information for you to make um, a clear and concise um, vote. Recuse yourself if you feel there is a conflict of interest. Maybe you have property within a certain area of a project um, or somebody who might in your family work for a contractor or something like that. You want to be mindful of what's on the agenda ahead of time to make sure if you need to recuse yourself. You always have a duty to vote. Um, recess, if we... Um, need to take a recess at any time. Any council or any committee member can ask the chair for a recess. The chair or vice chair can also take a recess. And then um, adjournment is always, uh, of course, at the end, you would announce the adjournment and um, we would note the time. And just to follow, <laughs> all committee meetings are open to the public, it's just a reminder. And that's pretty much all I have. I just wanted to briefly go over everything with you. I know we've talked about all of these items in detail, but I just wanted to put it all together in one spot so you have something to refer to. Anytime you have any questions or concerns, you can always ask me at the meeting, or if you can email me, give me a call. I'll be happy to help. Does anybody have any questions? I have a question. Um, the abstaining. So mm -hmm. If one or more members abstain, then can the motion still pass? If 
we would we would still have to have a majority of the vote. So yeah, we would still so we would um, have to bring it back, or we would have to find the reason why you're abstaining. If you're abstaining because there's not enough information, you might have to continue the item until the two or three persons that cannot make the decision can uh, make a concise vote. Yeah, the motion could also be not passed. Correct. I have a question. Sure. So, last city council meeting, they set the meetings. Those are our regular meetings. And do we do it every fourth Wednesday of the month? We have it on record right now every fourth Wednesday of the month. Okay. So, and if we do it, we have to cancel it. Or if we look at you another day, it's a special meeting, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. So, those are set. Yes. Okay. And that is it. Can you? Madam Chair. Well, thank you. Um, can we please have the approval of the minutes for June 10th, 2019 meeting? I'd make a motion to approve the minutes. Second. All in favor? Do you, have, you don't have to do a roll, do you? I don't have to um, call um, her. A question? Okay. Um, first page, the last sentence in the paragraphs. <laughs> Says uh, questions on items before them and explain once recommendations are complete, the recommendations will be taken to the city council for approval. I'm thinking the word all should be explained once all recommendations are complete. That's how uh, I start calling. Any questions on the items before them and explain once all? Yes, I can add that. So I will be adding all to the last sentence of once all recommendations are complete. I make a motion to approve the minutes as amended. Second. Okay. Um, I will go with member Yates. Aye. Member Warehead. Aye. Member Sandifer. Aye. Member Guy. Aye. He is out. Vice Chair Shaw. Aye. Chair Olmsted Bowen. Aye. Got it. Okay. The motion passes at unanimous. Okay, now we're going to have um, a general fund by um, summary by Gina, or Ms. Sh 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 Shugard, how do you spell it? I mean, I say it. Shugard. Shugard? Oh. I promised a two-page summary. I did give you some other handouts. The, the, actually, as close to one page as I could. Well, we're going to be going briefly through this, um, I, this particular handout, but I'll tell you what I also passed out. Um, I've included the mayor's and the city manager's message. Highly recommend reading them. They give a, 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 a vision and focus of, of the budget. And then the second item is what's in the budget document, uh, the general fund summary. And I may refer to this if you have any specific questions. And then I've got a graph, which I'm going to refer to in anticipation of a question. <laughs> and uh, so I'll begin with um, this particular spreadsheet right here. And what this is, is an expanded version of what's in the budget document. It's a general fund, revenues and expenditures, where, where the column has the actuals for last year, and this is one right here. And it has a budget, which was adopted last year, um, for July 1st. 1819, and then we amend it. We look at it at mid year. Um, it's the third column. And we come back to city council highlighting revenue increases, expenditure requests, any adjustments. And then we have a projected, and that projected moves through the budget process. We get data, we get information, revenues come in, mostly it's revenues coming in. And then we've got a proposed, and the proposed column is for the new fiscal year. So, what I'm going to do is direct you to the last, to the second page on it, and show you, start with the end. To the very bottom, you're going to see that um, for the budget, 1819, you'll see a negative number, $1.3 million. So we adopted the budget last year with a $1.3 million deficit. It's the second, here you go. It's the two page handout. Sorry. It should be oh, right off this one. Alright. Sorry. Okay. And it, 
The second column, under budget, second page, 1819 budget, we adopted the budget with a $1.3 million deficit. When we came back to City Council in February, we identified that the deficit had been reduced to $422,000. And then projected, and this is what we came back several weeks ago, with a $1.1 million revenues over expenditures. And as you can see, for next fiscal year, we have a deficit of $743,000. What I'm going to do is briefly walk through um, how we got from $1.3 million to a $1.1 million surplus. And through that, I will be describing the status of the general fund, um, the revenues, as well as the nature of the expenditures. I'll do it as briefly as I can, but feel free to ask questions. <laughs> I know Susan's listened to a lot of this, but... No, no, no. I so I will go through, so if we start the top I mean, with revenues, and I'll start with uh, property taxes. Um, and I'll briefly go down these categories. These are large categories. The details are in uh, this packet, if you want to know what's in each bucket. I won't go into too much of the details of which is in each bucket, but I'll go through the terms. And, um, so property taxes, self-explanatory. Um, Norco is doing well in terms of assessed valuation. When you see the report, we have a sale, we have a, um, a consultant, HDL, we've been hearing their name quite a bit. They're a property tax consultant as well as a sales tax consultant. They look into the details of our assessed valuations and they give us a report every October about how the city is doing. And they indicated last year the assessed valuations were increasing. So we had a good report. We didn't quite see it, of course, in revenues. Um, until recently. So of course we budget the for last year conservatively. We get the report in October and we've identified a $120,000 difference between the budget and the projected. And that increased. So that was part of our report in February. Um, and I'm just, I'm calling out numbers so you may not, if you'd like a detail, I'll give that to you. We go down to sales taxes. The difference between the budget and the projected was 502 thousand dollars. The reason behind that has to do with one-time revenue, sales tax revenue. The state of California is implementing a software program where businesses can upload their sales tax information and then also the state distributes it to the city. Well, software implementations go a little haywire. Um, big companies like Target have difficulty uploading and as a result a significant delay citywide or statewide. So some of these revenues went into prior years. So if you see our sales tax um, over time, you'll see, wait a minute, one year you receive less than you thought, and next year you receive more. It's this delay. And I've been told um, last week it's continued, not to the greatest extent that it did last year, but we're going to have a delay in revenues, and it may impact Measure R as well. So that's the biggest leap, was $500,000 in one-time revenue from prior years. Um, most of that from prior years. And you'll see, if you look at the sales tax um, for 1920, it went down to 7.1. 7.1 is where we should be. We're not a 7.5 city yet, it's a $7.5 million city. Um, 7.1 includes Lewis, uh, the Marco Village, uh, all that good stuff. So property tax in lieu, that is just a brief discussion on that. Uh, way back when, you might all remember, I motor vehicle license fees. Uh, uh, governor back in the 90s, early 2000s, decided to kind of take that. And I won't get into the dynamics of it, but there's a switcheroo going on there where property tax is, has been replaced in that. So it grows at the same assessed valuation as our property taxes. So that had a nice bump of $49,000. Other taxes, minor increase of $32,000. There, um, franchise fees, slight decrease. We're seeing cable TV being less um, used lots, as we all know, if you all have a Netflix account or Hulu. Um, so I'm slowly projecting that. It surprises me sometimes, but I'm projecting that to go down again. Um, so let's see. What's another growth there? Interest income is $163,000 change, and that's directly the result of investing $10 million of our reserves in higher than the state of California um, account that we have with LAFE, it's called. Um, so, of course, if we spend that money, that revenue really goes away. Uh, the next largest item is community development fees. These are all our development fees. I consider these one time, and we budget these conservatively at the beginning of the year. 
Um, they're related to building permits, plan check, and the city's being built out. So this is, I consider this one-time revenue. If we get surprises, which I think we're going to have one more year of surprises, uh, I'll be coming back in mid-year to adjust that upward. But that will not continue. And I think the other larger one is admin overhead operating transfers, $169,000. We're seeing, um, we did a cost allocation study, and we are looking at, um, actually that's for next year, you can see a big bump there, um, where um, we included a year-end adjustment for, um, excuse me, the flood control district. So we have increased revenues there, one-time revenues. So for a total of $1.5 million adjustment on the revenue side through this year was a big shift for us. And again, most of that one time. And um, some of it kind of like raised the boats a little bit in terms of property taxes, but I still take a conservative view on that. I've seen three recessions in my lifetime. So I think probably four if I count the gas tax the gas prices in the 70s. Um, so 1.5 million, that's all great news. It goes into the bank. Expenditures. I'll introduce the general fund departments. Do you know, as you all know, general fund revenues can be spent on anything. And that's what the general fund's all about. It's our largest fund. So we have city council. How they looked for this current fiscal year, we see a slight... Um, Increase in expenditures for the city attorney. We allocated more money for code enforcement in, at mid-year, and we do that. Do see that money being spent? Non-departmental is our catch-all. In there are expenditures related to uh, pension payments for our old fire department, risk management payments, um, the citywide programs. Um, so it's a catch-all that doesn't really fit under a one departmental name. We're seeing that we're underspending by $200,000. So that's the savings. That's our trend at this point. For administration, economic development, and finance, we're seeing $39,000 worth of being underspent. And I just have to caution you, we have some accounting items we do at year end related to compensated absences. And basically, that's a, an accounting term for booking um, kind of time not used by individuals at the cost of their uh, hourly rate. So some of us may or may not take vacations, so that has to get booked, put on the books. So we're going to see some adjustments uh, up and down in that area. That's our projection at this point. Recreation, we're seeing a slight um, over-expenditure of about $10,000. And that's normally attributed to building maintenance costs. That, um, we do our best to budget for those, but some are coming a little higher than others. Youth and teen, we're seeing an under-expenditure in teens and seniors, mainly because of some vacancies, but also we budgeted for the expenditure of a senior uh, transportation bus. And we're not looking at paying that bill this year, we're going to pay it next year. And animal control, it is only going to be providing $720 in savings. <laughs> so, we're going to take it. Now, now we get to the big ones. Um, Sheriff and fire. We are looking at a $588,000 um, under expenditure at this point. And the interesting part about the sheriff is there was a promise, political promise, made to look at the contracts and uh, provide some savings to cities. And it, it appears that has come through. We were looking at, we budgeted a 7% increase for a sheriff contract, and it's only coming at 2.2%. And what we have done, which has helped our next year's budget, is we have applied the county's 5% increase to that 2.2% base. So we saw savings in next year's budget as well. Um, from my long-term outlook on, on sheriff expenditures, they have pensions. This is a one-time savings, I believe. We have internal costs. They've got risk management costs. So we... We're going to take this, thank you very much, but I don't see it continuing. CAL FIRE has um, been an, an incredible partner uh, when it comes to um, how they format their budget. Um, we have seen consistent savings year to year. You're, you're told one thing and it comes in low. Um, 
that's the best I can, I can give you in terms of explaining um, the fact that we're looking at a three hundred fifty-six thousand um, dollar understanding of their contract this year. I think they're very conservative as well. They don't want to shock their um, uh, contract cities. So we're, we're going to take that. That total savings for both all public safety is five hundred eighty thousand dollars in the current year. For planning and uh, community development, they had some salary savings. Uh, so it's a fifty-five thousand dollars savings um, for this year. And public works, twenty-nine thousand. Similar situations and savings, their salary savings. And I just want to let you know from a budgeting perspective, we do budget at all our um, employees at each step, at our top step. You we may hire at a lower step, but conservative budgeting, you are hiring at higher steps. Some cities, Long Beach may come in at ninety percent and budget that way. It's more conservative. It's for bigger cities, you tend to do that. Smaller cities, we budget budget to the full amount. So you'll see us come in with lower adjustments throughout the year. Um, but so that's one factor where you're going to see um, adjustments in each department's budgets. So what I just explained on the expenditure side was a $921,000 decrease in what we thought we were going to expect. So add that to the $1.5 million in revenue. That takes us to a $1.1 million revenue over expenditure surplus, if you'd like to call it that. And, and then I'll ask you to go to um, the last page in this general fund summary. And this is what, um, if I were to give you just one page on the budget, I would have given you just this one. But if we would give you kind of a plot over here. This takes you through how the revenues and expenses were for the current year. It shows you the $1.1 million uh, revenues over expenditures and adds that to our year-ending July 1st of last year's surplus, or, or fund balance, excuse me, of $11.7 million. We add the 1.1, it's now $12.8 million for June 30th, 2019. So that's this number right here. Then we assign it as the beginning balance for this coming July 1st. $12.8 million, and then we go through the revenues and expenditures for next year. We're anticipating a $743,000 deficit. That reduces the overall fund balance to $12.1. Um, my projection at this point is $743,000. I, we might have another new year. We might. The only thing is if public safety comes back and says, oops, sorry, we've, we've got to um, uh, charge you more. Uh, but I'm thinking we're going to have some development on these um, We're very conservative on that. So we might have one more year where this deficit may go away, not to the tune of a million <laughs> over. So I'm crossing my fingers on that one. And then down below, we've got um, the city council has a policy that 25% of our budget should be assigned to reserve for emergency. If we were to apply that to $12.1 million that's in surplus, that would be $5.3 million. So we've covered that. Um, there were years where I'm sure that wasn't covered. And then we have 465000 in what are called special projects. Uh, several years ago, we had um, another fund where we held deposits, and a lot of years took a look at that, um, as well as a council member was aware of it and said, let's, excuse me, let's move that to the general fund where it should be. It rolls there anyway. So we have in our fund balance 465000 held for dozens of small projects. It could be donations from clubs that are being held for an expenditure at no Beaver. Um, we hold it there and wait for the expenditure to come up. And so that's the overview. Um, there have been questions, and I'll, ask, I'll put this out there. There have been questions in the past, well, why don't we spend that $12.8 million, or $12.1 million? You know, apply it to someone. And I just wanted to share with you a graph um, that Andy did last April 2018, the 10-year financial forecast. And the way I look at uh, fund balance is kind of like how we look at our own budgeting environment personally. There are, if you get an extra, if you got an IRS refund or you got a bonus check at work, um, the same questions are asked. So how can I spend this? What can I spend it on? Um, spend it on a trip, you can spend it on um, you know, fixing something in the house. You might buy a car, right? So if you buy a car, 
there's future expenses, operating expenses associated with that. So we have to make sure we have that in our um, monthly income to cover that expense if we use the money for that. So it's similar to, and I know I'm, I'm doing basic when I want on here, but I just basic to, to government is it's of course we look at the surplus, what can we apply it to? Well Andy who did this um, table when it was last April, it's before we heard some good news. Um, and he projected a deficit for last year and this year and the coming year. Let's just imagine we push that out, because I believe we bought ourselves a couple of years with that. With this conservative increases in revenue expenditures, we can see, even at the reserve level of $10 million, how quickly our reserve disappears. And these assumptions were basic pension increases that the county, with the city, um, conservative revenue expenditures, uh, revenue um, projections, and even just those expenditures increasing over time, we're going to eat into our reserve. So that bonus check that we have is, it, and I tell you, I'm very impressed with how it's grown, grown in a time of recession. Um, we could, and this really is not indicating recession, it's just indicating the expenditures going on. If we have a recession, of course, it becomes more of a, a V up top, and it'll dip into our reserves even faster. It's exponential. I call that avalanche. You know, you've got to dig yourself out of the hole and then, <laughs> and then some. So um, that's kind of like our philosophy at this point in time um, in terms of how we balance our budget, how we handle our, look at our revenues and expenditures. We look forward to coming back in February and sharing some good news. Um, my personal view about the future, I think we're a couple years off from a recessionary environment. Um, sales tax is greatly impacted by the uh, collection that we have here, the collection of businesses. We're strong in autos. We experience an increase like every other city did in uh, sales taxes related to autos. We're seeing a flat like that right now. Um, but we are seeing you know, raises from the New York Coast Village, as well as in the up. So the first of our the first buyer sales tax base. So I think I took longer than five minutes, but um, if you have any questions. I know this is a complicated question, so so if you can't give me a, an answer, that's that's fine. Um, with these kind of deficits, and growing deficits every year, at what point would we would we be at risk of having to declare bankruptcy? In, Bankruptcy is a complicated question. Um, it's, in fact, I'll even step back from that. That is a, a, a legal decision that's made over months and months of consideration. Um, so I wouldn't say at this point, Vanny, we're here to say, okay, we have to do bankruptcy at this point. I think we look at every option we have possible. Um, and we do have options. But, um, it really is looking at who we are. And I think you might have, as you've heard of the last year or so, we have to look at our lifestyle. We have to look at, you know, recreation is a different large department. Do we get out of recreation? Do we contract out of, do we merge? I mean, even to the point of merging with other jurisdictions. There's all, you know, but basically America was here because a group of individuals wanted a, this unique environment, this lifestyle, and when we, different from everybody else. So before we get to bankruptcy, you would hear from us with all sorts of other options and opportunities um, to have that not happen. So. Plus we have Measure R. Correct. <laughs> this is why we passed Measure R. I mean, this is, this is pre-Measure R numbers, and it's also very, very, very conservative, and I don't think it's gonna ever get to this point personally, and then what you do is you start cutting parks and recs, you start finding different, no offense to anybody in parks and recs, but I mean, that's just what you do in government. This, these are projections and they're not reality. They're, um, they're, I mean, I don't, I saw what the city went through with, you know, only having 65,000. I've talked to people, I know people that work here. I admire all the people that have gotten the city to this point. However, um, I think I was also personally involved with passing Measure R, 
And my problem with backfilling the general fund and converting Measure R money, this is where my conflict comes. Converting Measure R money to general fund money by giving money to the general fund so that they can spend it any way they want is where I have a problem because I personally, you know, put my reputation out there and supported the measure and was part of the pack and everything. So um, that's in, and I have been talked to about this. I personally feel the city's going to be about break even at the end of the year. My personal feeling, knowing the economy and how government works in concern. I'm conservative too. I get the same thing at where I'm a finance director. Okay, they say, we know that we're selling property, property tax is going to go up. I get the same thing. So I understand what you're, you know, where this is, but I do have a problem uh, backfilling the general fund and converting Measure Our Money into general fund because we promised the public that, that would not happen. So there's, uh, I don't have a problem spending it. I think, I think that um, that you're right. We should be really pushing on infrastructure right now and getting stuff done. Um, but anyway, I, that's just my personal opinion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of kind of agree. I mean, when I look at the revenue forecast, they're pretty flat, and we look at history. Uh, Revenue forecasts, or revenues over history have not been flat. Uh, I mean, I think it's good to get a sense that, well, if things were to go follow that trend, that's where we would be heading. We need to take measures to prevent it. But, but at the same time, I, I honestly feel that you know, that the revenues. I mean, we're showing. Than increasing over a uh, ten-year period by two million dollars, when in fact, if we look between um, seventeen and eighteen, and uh, you know, uh, well, the projected for eighteen and nineteen, I mean, we see a uh, you know, fairly you know significant growth mm -hmm. in, in in our revenue stream without. Without Measure R, and I agree that we use Measure R to fund those things that the citizens had wanted, you know, wanted funded. Infrastructure certainly one of the big ones. Any other comments? Thank you. So, we have a motion to receive and file? Can we get that question? Oh. Can we get that question? Um, I have no cards. Oh, I know. Okay. He's going to bring you a card. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. My question is just with the past meetings and then the council, you know, what they did at the last council meeting with the budget, can you amend any of your previous work currently? Okay. So like, you mean amend what they're doing? Well, like they had approved the additional. <laughs> Uh, sheriff's department people, okay. and that's. But they've that's, already amended that. That's coming back to them after today. They'll be bringing that back right. for okay. their final recommendations that they're following. Final recommendations. Right. Okay, that's. We're going to go back through all our recommendations and solidify them. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is that the plan? Okay. That's going to happen in July, and okay. and in August. Um, to council. We're, um, in August, we're going to approve the, Andy's going to write this, this report, staff report about our recommendations, and in August, so it'll go, didn't we decide to yeah, it'll, uh, it's going to go to the council? Right now, he's, if these two items today get approved um, to, you know, um, to move forward without any continued, um, he would bring all the recommendations back for your July meeting for review. And then it would be August for um, to city council. So that's the timeline right now. That's what he wrote on his email to me. Someone need to sign it. I thought we were gonna. He's, no, that's not what we discussed in his office. We discussed that in July, all the recommendations would be reviewed, and we would decide on them then. And then in August, he would bring us the memo 
for us to approve. Approve, okay. And then the first meeting in September, it would go to council. Is and it, and if we, that's the direction, well, that's, that's what fine. we'll do. Okay. That's fine. That, isn't that what we're doing? Okay, so. so so what is it? What's that? No gaslighting here. It's not me. <laughs> I think sometimes I think I'm crazy. I do, you know. So basically, to recap: July we would look at what you guys have talked about to date, um, and then in August you would review the staff report and recommendations going forward, and council would look at those considerations in September. I be yeah, I believe you said the first meeting in September. Yes. So, so then the July meeting is the meeting that's appropriate to, um, if we want to change any of the items that we have, or we want to discuss changing okay. it, it would be at that meeting, not tonight. We can rescind and amend or do any of the recommendations and um, move forward. And, and you may find... I can't see. <laughs> <laughs> and you may find that we, you want more information. We this. I think the direction is, is if we have to push this a little further, we'll do so just to make sure that it's reflective of what you want. Right now. Okay. Hold on. Okay, Mr. Teacher, you're up. Did you want to? We're um, discussing Riley Jim. Insulation and Nellie Winger Hall insulation. Here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, insulation projects. There we go. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, tonight, we're going to, one of the discussion points was to take a look at two of the items which were the insulation projects uh, take a look at because we had some previous discussion even at the council uh, budget workshop about uh, looking at other potential options and you guys also said let's look at what all the options are so so we've been working on that uh, uh, and at the end uh, there's quite a bit of information that will that has come from that to look at so tonight I'm going to take you through the process of what we've done and what we've looked at um, one, uh, Riding Gymnasium is 15,000 square feet facility, so only youth basketball, volleyball. Uh, we, several years ago, we got a grant for uh, doing energy efficient lighting. We did do that. Um, in this upcoming budget, coming out of our DIF money, we'll be redoing the floor. The floor is at that 19 year span, it has to be redone. Part of the big issue for us in Measure Arbor is doing the roof because the roof leaks in several areas. And we have an insulation problem where the insulation is actually falling off the walls and the ceiling. Um, this facility is one of the most heavily used facilities in the city. Uh, we have over 84,000 visitors. That includes uh, participants that visit that facility annually. The current condition of the interior insulation was installed in L1, and this was a spray on type of insulation. It's a cellulose paper product. It also has a fire retardant properties that are in it. That isn't even manufactured. You could not even go out today and replace what we had back almost 20 years ago. Uh, insulation is deteriorating and falling off the walls and ceilings. It's outlived its life expectancy. They typically talk about the old spray on cellulose as about a 10 year span for re then you need to redo it. Uh, exposure fiberglass on ceiling, which, is, uh, which has trapped moisture ineffective and not effective insulation for the facility and existing materials. So in other words, when we talk about, we'll talk a little bit about R factor and what that is what's giving you uh, what it, your thermal rating to allow you to uh, keep it cooler or keep it warmer in that time. Uh, and the actual old cellulose paper was, did not have a high rated R factor. Uh, this will give you kind of a little bit of idea. You can see here where we have spots that are just falling off. You can see where the insulation is uh, coming off of the walls. And this type of situation is throughout the ceiling. Uh, one of the uh, problems uh, related to this type of insulation, which is based out of a paper product, is when the roof leaks, 
paper and water do not do very well together. So that was one of the issues after a time. This is a metal building. Uh, typically, it was called years ago like a butler building. And uh, during temperature changes, it has, the, it has a tendency to expand and contract. It moves, just like your barn will do that as well. <coughs> Uh, this is a, shows you a little bit of the problems we have with the insulation coming off the walls and the ceilings. Um, again, just more pictures of the degradation of this material and it coming down. Um, insulation, when it provides resistance to heat transfer, minimizes the buildup of condensation in a building, provides more efficient temperature control, reduces the level of outside noise, it can be heard within, doesn't allow for the nesting of rodents, birds, and bugs, and prevents mold from growing. If you don't have a leaky roof. So I'll uh, quantify that. So, um, our, our value, before getting into different types of insulation, which I'm going to show you some examples that we've been looking at and doing more homework on this thing, um, what you'll find is that insulation or that our value you get, and I'll Many of you look at that when you're putting that into your homes. Uh, is how the power of insulation to prevent heat transfer is measured. The more effective a layer of insulation is, the higher the R value is. There are a variety of insulation material options available and new technologies that are coming to the public's attention to provide even greater thermal resistance and energy savings, much, much greater than we did back in 2001. So the difference of what technology has gone in these areas is significant. Uh, for example, in an insulation R value, and this is per inch, and I've given a couple of, these are the typical types of insulations you would see, and you'll see that a R value per inch, 3.7, so depending on the thickness of your uh, insulation, that's going to increase your uh, value. Um, typically, what we've been looking at is trying to reach to about an R19 in the gymnasium. Uh, and I've gone through rigid material, fiberglass bat, uh, polyurethane, spray. Uh, and, and some of these, are, I give you a whole list just for your information. Some of them are better fitted for the environment which we're putting it in than others would be uh, that we do. An example is that's is a metal building. So certain installations are going to be more effective than others. Insulation option one. This is a spray polyurethane foam. This has technology has come tremendously uh, has grown in popularity. One because of its effectiveness. This is a spray applied closed cell plastic. It can form a continuous insulation of air seal barriers on the walls, roofs, around corners, and on all counter. Uh, contour surfaces, which is affected because we have a lot of our, our joists and our purlins and stuff the way they use. This is an example where they actually mask off uh, your, your rafters and some of your areas as they spray this on, and that comes back off and it's pain. Uh, mixing to the reactant unique liquid components. The liquid reacts very quickly when mixed, ending um, the contact to create foam and insulate seals, gaps, and can or moisture or vapor barriers. What's interesting about this material is, is that it's similar to what the paper product did, but it is so much more advanced because of the R factor. But more so than this, this actually seals wherever you may have a penetration. So in other words, in a metal building, as, uh, our, as our old insulation starts to come off, I'm finding it looks like someone shot holes in the side of the building and or in roof penetrations. What this does is actually seals that. And it does not let that moisture in, uh, uh, seep through. And reducing pretty much air want, unwanted air uh, infiltration through cracks, seams, and joints. And on another building, that's kind of an important factor. Um, benefits, low energy costs, stops drafts, allergies, and uh, condensations. Um, better indoor air quality, does not settle or shrink. Quieter indoor environment, fills irregular shapes, increases climate comfort, adds structural strength, seals, cracks, voids, and keeps out unwanted pets. 
Insulation option two is a rigid insulation, and this provides a hard backing that would be pressured, and then your, the, the backing of this is your insulation. Uh, typically, we're looking at about 15,000 square feet for a footprint of the ceiling. That doesn't include the walls. So with the walls, we're a little over 20,000 square feet of insulation. Um, this is, uh, product is not a bad one in the sense that it does a lot of the same, provides a lot of the same benefits. Uh, it has a fiber class backing, which really provides a really good R factor. The challenge is, is that moisture does affect the R factor in fiberglass and actually reduces that R factor over time. Uh, but this was an option that we looked at that would best probably fit the application where we would be applying it to. Again, lower energy costs made of closed cell board, foam and boards, helps limit moisture buildup. The mildew provides an extra bit of sound insulation. Fairly thin, lightweight insulation material that offers a lot of protection, has a high R value, uh, however, suffers from decreased R values over time. Um, um, probably one of the opposites to this in a metal building is it doesn't always fill every crack. So, in a situation in some warehousing where you would use this type of application in a metal building, that may not be that big of a deal. In a gymnasium, different application. So, uh, when we looked at this, is, it, it is a, a viable option for us to look at. The other one is insulation option number three, bad blanket insulation. A lot of you will see this in a Costco or in some other locations. And there's very, a couple different types of products that come out of this. This is the most common type of insulation used in pre-engineered structures such as metal buildings. Due to its low cost and ease of insulation, fiberglass blanking insulation has added benefits of being both fire and sound resistant. The insulation is outfitted with vapor retarders and tested for fire safety, as well as outdoor mold and moisture resistance. The vapor retarder acts as a finish on most metal buildings and ceilings, and because of that, the outward facing side is white and color uh, for better light reflectivity in your structure. Um, one has lower insulation price than many of the other types of insulation. And I think we've talked a little bit about that option. This is a little bit cheaper than what you would find. Uh, lower energy costs, fire retardant through its life, does not settle over time, reduces the level of noise going into the facility due to natural sounds, dampening properties of the fiberglass, because it has a fiberglass backing on it. Um, made from recycled materials, thus reducing the uh, reliance of fossil fuels is another benefit that we're repurposing. Uh, very flexible, creating snug fits, uh, does not fit or fill within cracks and voids. Uh, it does sometimes in the application, as we were, we had different contractors come out to talk to us, but one of the issues with this is penetrations. So when you're hanging this, you have to have some sort of penetration to get it to hang and stay. And then you have to have some way of anchoring it so that it doesn't. One of the, and I'll talk a little bit more about one of our problems with the facility. Um, let me, let me go back real quick and I'll come back to this. Can I ask a question at this time? Yeah. Okay. So um, the batting, the blankets, mm -hmm. there was a line at the bottom that you didn't cover, and something about it needs Does a radiant cover? It, um, I'll go back to that. It, let me look real quick. It, it doesn't fill cracks and voids. And you're talking about the batting, right? Yes. Oh, there we go. Oh. Uh, it does not fill any cracks and voids. Okay. Um, and then uh, needs additional radiant barrier block. <coughs> In other words... Uh, the seal on the back side of, of, the, uh, of the insulation. So you'll add a radiant barrier for the blocking of that. This is the top part. Then there is a, uh, uh, the fiberglass seal, which in, we're, we're recommending at least three inches to get at least to an R19. And then the back side is on this. Now, they do make one that has a harder lid on it that costs the look on that. Okay, what so I wanted to show additional radiant barrier blocking. That's part of the blanket. Right. Okay. Yeah, and if you would, and actually the application on this, they'll roll it. Um, and it rolls into sections, and then you're going to fasten it. Sometimes those fastens are going to go through the ceiling, or they go to the lateral sides of it. But it has to be fastened in some way so it doesn't sag. 
And then you'll see that uh, in one here, in, one, in some applications, and you, if you go into, let's use a Costco as an example, uh, you'll all sometimes will find that they do a netting or something to help and keep that reinforced to the ceiling. Um, one of the things that I wanted to show you that when we were looking at the gymnasium that is one of our, our big concerns and cost. As we were out here in the last two weeks with different people looking and evaluating this, what we, excuse me, what we found in here, as this is peeling off and coming back, we have found a fiberglass uh, barrier underneath all that. Now, I don't know if that's from 1971 when this was built, but that's going to have to be completely removed. And the trouble, and what our cost is not in the material, it's in the labor. And the labor at prevailing wage is going to be high. Because our problem here is that every bit of this has to be removed before you can apply any insulation. And that includes the batting, because if it falls and weights down, it creates a problem. So one of our costs, and every contractor, every person we talk to, this has to all be removed. One, and one contractor said, your best bet would be to remove all of this, paint these, the uh, joists, uh, the purlins, and then uh, reapply the foam material, because that fills all of your voids that you have, cracks, other things. And then paint these out, because you don't really need this. When they did this years ago, this was all sprayed on. All of the joists, everything was sprayed over. Um, so my problem is, is that starting to come off? You cannot leave this, and we're going to have to examine this fiber cat, fiberglass barrier behind it to actually determine what needs to be done. Those are going to have to become. Everybody we've talked to has said that has to be done. Now to add to this, I brought on a, an architectural firm to assist us who's done work in this area and has done some pro bono work for us. So I'm kind of waiting for their evaluation on it. But our primary cost, so just to let you know from some of these different cost factors, I've seen um, some of the batting as low as a buck forty-one to six dollars and something. The challenge is, is, is the labor. The labor and cost is what drives this particular cost. Yes? So wouldn't it be more cost efficient to do the roof and just demo that whole thing and strip it down all at once? Two different trades. You're going to go to a general contractor. Then the general contractor is going to bring a roofing contractor in. He's going to spec that. This is going to be a different trade than that trade. I think doing the roof and sealing our roof is essential for anything that we do on the interior. Part. So they're not connected. It's not like. No, no, no. There's a metal there's, roof uh, on the interior part, space. and then you have this fabric vacuum that was done that I need to evaluate. Then you have this spray on paper insulation that uh, is 20 years old. And so what we have to do is actually remove this material um, and then come back with whether, whether we come back with any of those three different options I gave you um, we're going to have to do that. What does the old fiberglass, is it asbestos? Great question. <laughs> Don't know yet. Because I mean that jacks up the, the, the year. Removing. Yes. The year that in which this was then I would say no. If we were in the late 60s, then I would. So I think we're okay. But it's something that I have to now that's been brought to my attention. I and, I and towards my conclusion, you'll understand why. I need some more time to take a look at this situation. What's it? Yeah, just the lifetime of each of those three products. Uh, typically, you're going to get 20 years regardless. Um, yeah, and in some cases, you may get more. Uh, but you're going to have to come in and do some repairs because things happen. The problem on, like, uh, other than the, uh, the spray on, your R factor reduces over time. It just does. It breaks down, the fibers break down, and that's what happens. It still is an effective, and it's a more inexpensive product, but you're still going to get 20 years out of it. But if you were, you, you want an R19 
19 is what you're recommending. So do you know what the deterioration is over time? So say if you went to, I don't know, an R25 that by year 15 you're, you're still... You know, yeah, the, 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 the challenge here is that this section of the building is not air conditioned. So I don't know that we really need to really put a high rated insulate. You're going to spend more money as you get right. there. Then the cost of uh, fasting that goes up to, so that it's, it's going to be proportionate to what you're doing. What we're talking about is a three, inch, uh, three inches, which would probably give us probably what we not, and 19 years, I think, is pretty sufficient for what we're looking at here. Uh, and you'll find at the end, when I come back to you, because my recommendation will be that we actually uh, table this for continuation for us to go back and finalize a few things and some unit costs. Uh, one, because uh, we just have learned a lot over the last process in picking the right solution. You, you can go this way. You save money here. Right. You're not going to save, I don't think, that much labor all the way across. You're going to save money here, but is that a better product for longevity? That's what I'm going to bring back to you. It's, it just seems that your big ticket is going to be the preparation. Yeah, absolutely. The, the tear out and preparation. Right. And, and then my other issue, which was brought up, is that I need to determine if I have any mitigation issues. So, I really don't believe so, but the fiber or fiberglass needs to be removed and disposed of properly. One last. Okay. Is there any health effects? Of I don't. I, I, and that, that was my immediate concern when we saw that, and I don't think so, but I have that being looked at right now. Okay. So, can you explain what redoing this roof means? Because in my little, you know, layman's thinking, you, the roof itself is the roof and the ceiling are kind of the same thing. No. What is it on this building? Because I don't understand. With a lot of metal buildings, there isn't anything in between. So yeah. I don't understand what redoing the roof is. Like how does that impact the ceiling? Redoing the roof stops the leak. Yes. So can you, like, there's the roof and then what? There's a roof and then you have metal sheeting across underneath the, the Underneath the roof. Okay, so the well, roof let, isn't... Can let me explain to you. Let me do a little bit better. There is a metal roof sheeting, okay? And the way this building is done is that every seam is taped and fastened with rivets, and they overlap. Okay. So over time, as a building like this expands and contracts and moves, what happens is that tape goes bad, those rivets go bad, and you get penetrations from water or whatever. Or if someone hits it and you have a hole in the roof, then that could cause that. That's part of a metal roof. Uh, what the product that we are recommending in our roof seals that whole roof with white knight. White knight is a product that actually seals it from the complete end and the, and the fascia. What that does is gives me one solid mm -hmm. membrane on the top. Okay. It is lightweight, energy efficient, and uh, and then also what it does is I do a touch-up every 10 years to get a 20-year roof, which means that if I have a leak in that roof due to that, my warranty covers all the repairs to that. What the problem is here is this is insulated, sprayed on, to help with the R factor. If you did the roof and you had nothing up there, you're just going to have a noisy metal building, basically. What this does is provides uh, more sound help. Uh, it provides insulation to keep it cooler. Uh, and so that's what the insulation So is. when you're redoing this roof, you're not, you're just going, so essentially you're going to put a coating on the top and a coating on the bottom. Yeah. But we're not replacing any of the metal. No. no. Anywhere. No. Okay. No. And the challenge on, on a metal building in, okay. in my inspections uh, is that I'm finding penetrations and holes, which means I need to seal those. If I have holes and penetrations, then I have a problem with pests getting into the facility. I have a problem from additional leakage from the sides, actually. And so this building was insulated on the top and the sides because you have a whole bunch of kids here playing. It's to help deal with sound. Plus, 
keep the building more climate control because you don't have AC. What we have is swamp coolers. And they work pretty good except for when it's really humid. So what we're looking at right there is not the roof. It's the ceiling. Well, what you're seeing is this is part of a, a fiberglass panel. If I tore all this up, then you get to the metal roof. Okay. And this, by the way, that was probably our original. And then this gray stuff, that's sprayed on. That, this is all sprayed on. Uh, but there's no space. Like, so my house has a roof. And then there's there is no, no space. ceiling. There's no way. There's no, yeah, no so there's no space in between. Okay, no. so it's all the same product. It's just how you're going to layer stuff up on top and how you're going to layer stuff underneath it. Right. Okay. Oh, that makes sense. And with all the penetrations that you've seen in the roof, you don't see any structural issues with, because yeah. eventually, you know, enough Swiss cheese. Structural is really, it's really good. It, it is a light structural building, so adding things to the roof that are heavy is means that the, that roof would need to be reconstructed. I mean, okay. you'd probably do a complete tear off, bring it up to all the additional coats. So I don't think that that's really But good. that's not what we're doing. No, it's not what we're doing. Okay. So on some of the other roofs that we're doing, though, you are doing that because they're a different structure roof. Yeah, if, for example, if I have a what they call uh, on my deck is wood, and I and I have leaks. We're tearing off the deck, replacing the deck, putting a new roof on, and and putting whatever product that would be that provides us that insulation. Okay. Uh, provides us not the insulation, but provides us that barrier for leaks, and then that's part of the manufacturer warranty as well. So, in a lot of our roofs, that's what we are recommending. Uh, we have a lot of city hall has a flat roof. And it has a specific coating over it to protect it. And then we have a maintenance program with it. What we recommended in our roofing project is all the skylights here are 30 years or older and they leak. So wherever I have a sky, you, and the skylights are different now, the code required them. Uh, these, if you stood on them, you'd fall through. It's much different now. So all of our skylights here at City Hall have problems and they create leaks. So those are being recommended for replace. Senior center, uh, you have both a shingle and you have flat roof. So we're going to be repairing the flat roof section of that. The shingles are in good shape. So uh, the two metal roofs, which we deal with, is Nelly Weaver Hall and uh, uh, Riding Gymnasium. So but I want to talk a little bit about options and Nelly Weaver Hall. When we did an evaluation in the last two weeks, the interior insulation will need some repairs. However, the interior replacement and configuration of the roof footprint would be challenging for insulation options and very costly based on our recent evaluation. Let me explain to that. If you go into Nellie River Hall, you have a lot more purlins, you have a lot more rafters. We have some areas that need correction because the leaks in the roof cause those. But every contractor, everyone I had look at it says, to remove all of this, I'm telling you, would be cost prohibitive. It will cost you a fortune. But if you fix these little areas, and we go with it, so what we've been doing is working with our roofing consultant and looking at another product and take the insulation to the exterior and put our roofing product on it. We can then get an R35. And that's what I'm looking at right now. So uh, the time that we put in, we've looked and done a little more research. I'm waiting back and consulting on that. And what that does is it puts a three-inch um, foam barrier. Now, this foam barrier is different than that Station 57, which the birds love. It's a different one. The White Knight product, which is a total seal of the roof, goes on top of it. The difference between White Knight and that is it allows contraction and flexibility. So what ends up happening in any rigid type building with foam, your problem is, is that, and you get problems with that. Cracks, outside seals break, etc. The White Knight seals that and allows the flexibility of that roof when it heats up to expand and as it gets cools to retract. So what that does is allows us to put 
a different type of situation in where we get a 20 year roof. At 10 years, you do a uh, maintenance makeup on it and you get an R35. That's important <coughs> because that building is fully air conditioned and we just forget. So we're looking at that. So what I, based on my findings and um, by the way, I'm not a mechanical engineer who would look at this, is we've been working with uh, some consultants and with different contractors are looking at a variety of different options. <coughs> so after this, what I'd like to do is come back to you. We, in the other projects that you've approved, I, I don't want to take this, because we need to talk about it more, but I don't need to do it right now. I want to make sure that we're making the best decision. So I think taking these two, if we don't have all the answers by the time you go to September, we're going to be working together for a long time. I'll be bringing this back to you maybe at mid-year. But I'm also going to do some cost analysis, which I want to do, because I need to, I want to show you what the cost analysis on material and then labor is, because that's going to drive. When you see that there is a huge disparity, so I think at right, Jim, we were looking at 198,000. That cost will actually probably go up now, based on some of our findings. In other words, and but it may go down based on what we recommend. The difference on that is the labor is still going to be up. There. Most of that is all labor. It is not the product. And it's not an option at Riley Gym to do what you're doing at Nellie Weaver, which is put the insulation on the outside. No, we wouldn't even go to that extent because it's not a seat. The only reason I'm trying to get that R35 but is because it's a seat. Down the road, it's easier to take off. You don't have to go and scrape and... and well, the, a foam roof is mm -hmm. very difficult, is very expensive to remove. Okay. Yes. And so what... What protects that foam roof is the white knot. That's what seals it. That's what gives you that 20-year roof protection in your warranty. So what you do is you come back after 20 years and you recoat it somewhere what they, they use on a lot of the warehouses. And I know I'm asking you a very layman's question. So when you do the more analysis, can you just somehow in your next presentation to us make sure to explain why, like just show like if you were to do Riley Gym this way, it would be like, you know, five hundred thousand dollars more right. versus doing this because to me it yes. sounds like we could do a one-time. You know, from what I heard and not knowing anything about insulation, you would do a one-time fix to Riley Gym and get all that hook off of it, and then just do the other kind of roof because then in twenty years, it it seems like it should be easier to remove all of that and put a new one on and not have to go and use labor, which is the most cost, the thing that costs the most and scrape off all of the nonsense that's adhered to it. Yeah, so doing the uh, the one that's the most effective because it does all the sealing, um, when we look at that, and then by the time you scrape everything off, paint all your joists, paint out your purlins and everything, um, we were, and, and mitigate potentials there, we're, we're close to 300,000, mm -hmm. okay? Now, this is much cheaper product to, to pick. And once we clean it all up, you don't see the ugliness, I guess, but it has an effective approach. And then in 20 years, you may be replacing sections of that. So probably in the long term, what I want to do the analysis, this option might be more cost effective. It's not going to change the labor, but the product will give us a benefit. And I think I want to show you those options so you can say, yeah, you know, and then our recommendation would be based on that. I still, my problem is the uh, side panel insulations. And so one of the thoughts was to look at maybe doing this on the, on the roof. And then, um, because I'm going to get a seal on the roof. I'm not worried about the leak. And then on the sides, maybe do the spray insulation. And then is there just my own personal metal barn that I own? One side of my barn gets significantly crazy stupid hot. So is there any consideration in this facility to the side that gets the afternoon sun, um, especially in the summer with the longer days, having that have a higher R factor so that that's not heating your... Is that even a consideration? What we would probably... To, what we... Where we would fill that the most would be this, uh, what I would say, the west side. Okay? 
And so where we would see that is, is, and where you would maybe beef that up would be the, if we did a spray insulation on the side. That may be more effective on that, go a little thicker or heavier um, than the rest of it. But that's something I'll talk to the, the consultant and all of them about. It's a good question, and we most certainly can look at that in our evaluation to help reduce it, because as the sun sets, this is the side that's going to heat up. Actually, I'm sorry. Uh, this is your east side, and then through these curtains is the west side over here. It doesn't show it. That is your, this, um, uh, that is the west side. And it's not to say with the moisture issues we had and heat, because that's going to get the hottest that side. That, that doesn't, that's not why we had the problems with the paper product, paper insulation. So, anyway, so at the end of the day, um, I'm glad we did this, because um, it, it, it really, I think, helped us uh, from staff standpoint, but it also helps us to try and make the right decision and bring forward to you some options for consideration. As we get ed more educated on, the, on what is the best solution, I think it's important for us to share that with you. And then what we could then do is bring the, the three options we looked at are probably collectively the best options. But what I want to do is the analysis and the cost analysis and bring those back. And uh, one of the challenges is, is to get really good pricing uh, from that. So um, GMID, who has given us some, pro, will do some pro bono work for us, uh, I think will uh, help us in a little bit of that estimating. So, um, bottom line is, is that I'm going to be working on that, and then I will bring that, I, these items back to you for consideration, um, because they are something we, we've got to do something about. Um, but I don't want to hold up where your momentum is right now, and I think let's take the time to really look at this, and look, you know, our, our responsibility is spend those dollars prudently, and I think we've learned a lot from this to be able to do that. And I think it uh, will be helpful when I bring back more information. Yeah, uh, I'm sure I speak for the whole committee that we appreciate the effort you've put into this thus far versus just $198,000 in that first proposal to the month ago. And, and, and uh, trying to understand. We're looking forward to the pricing. Right. I, I'm worried it might be more than that, but well, it is what it is, and we'll take a look. Well, it's better to know that now than. Right, right, right. And it maybe we'll know how much money we have. Because right now it's just an estimate. Right. There's, there's still and we may have more, we may have less. So I think <laughs> so my, and I, I talked to Andy a little bit about this, so I think I think it's I think it's a prudent decision for us to just to really go back and do the more homework on our and bring it to you and look at those options so we can collectively take it. We'll provide a recommendation and why. But collectively look at it because when I look, when we got down to those three, that they all have pros and cons, and so I'm trying to think about okay, what would be the pro here? Maybe I get, I don't want to have the problem. Well, 25 years from now, I probably won't be worrying about it. So maybe it's <laughs> but uh, I don't want to leave someone something. Go, oh crap! Why did they spray that stuff on there? You know what I mean? It would have been easier to. Maybe do the batting and do even it's we still have this labor of cleaning it up, but that might be a better cost effective way and still get the R value. And to William's question is as that degrades, it still may be cheaper in the long run to do a, a replacement or whatever every 15 or 20 years of that, because that's all you're having to replace, versus having to do all the maintenance and cleanup. So I think that's Kind of what you were talking about too is what's the long term options that are more, more effective. So that's what we'd like to bring back to you. But I need some time to do that and my staff. And it's been a real good educational process for, for my staff as well. Um, I have another question or comment. Um, so on the blankets and, and batting, I think you said there would have to be roof penet penetrations in order to hang this material. So we got to be sure that we don't put on this nice new roof and then we go through and put holes in it to hang them. Absolutely, you got to be on that. Yep. Okay. So what we would do is we did that might come in afterwards. We'll have an award contract 
but it'll also say all penetrations in our contract must be sealed, filled, and all of that. So when we do award day, it would be one of the last ones we do. And by time on the roofing, because our best time to bid roofing is going to be in the fall or late fall, after the summer and the school districts are all done, because we're going to get our best price per square foot for roofing at that point in time. So when we go out, I can I can phase that so that it, it hits at the proper time. And this will be something, if we have all of the details, we'll bring it back. That can go back forward as another recommendation. And then, again, I think Susan said is, we'll also by then have a better understanding of what the funds look like and that type of thing. So uh, I felt it was, I really don't want to rush this without doing it right. I think that that's what we're here to do, all of us together work as a team like that. And at this point, I'd like to make a motion to defer the Riley Gym insulation project and the Nellie Weaver Hall insulation project until further research is done. And we're going to be meeting, in a, so I may have something within 60 days or less that has the whole breakout for you. So we'll come back with updates. Okay. And thank you, Brian. It was really interesting. I think pictures help to see what's falling off the roof, too. Okay. I'll go ahead with the vote. Member Yates? Aye. Member Wareheim? Aye. Member Sandifer? Aye. Member Guy? Aye. Vice Chair Shaw? Aye. Chair Olmstead Bowen? Aye. The motion passes unanimously. You didn't like my pictures. Okay, now we're ready for public comments. This is the time of persons in the audience wishing to address <laughs> the Measure Our Citizens Oversight Committee regarding matters not on the agenda. Make speech. Please complete a speaker card in the back room and present it to the city clerk so that you may be recognized. The Ralph M. Brown Act limits the committee's ability to respond to comments on non agendized matters at the time such comments are made. Committee shall not discuss or take action relative to any general public comment. Do we have any cards? We have two cards. The first speaker is Nancy Braggins. <laughs> thank you. See, your move was nice. I should have pushed it back. <laughs> and first of all, thank you all for uh, stepping up and volunteering to be a committee member. I know it's a Challenging and difficult job sometimes. I, as a citizen, I also really appreciate you putting your time and effort into it. So thank you very much. Um, if this might have already happened, I just was wondering if you had created a mission statement for the committee. Um, not only would it help you in making decisions, but would also going forward help the, the future oversight committees with guidelines on how to make decisions. Uh, you know, mission statements are. Uh, generally broad, but very specific at the same time. So I, I heard um, Susan mentioned about how your reputation was on the line of Measure R, that there are certain things that we expect Measure R citizens to do for us. And uh, I think the mission statement might help that. You may have already done that already, but um, <clears throat> I just have some notes here, so I'll just read what I wrote down. Um, and if you have done it, I apologize for suggesting it. Um, I know you have bylaws. So, um, some of the things I thought, like, you know, what are your guiding principles? Are they one-time expenditures, personnel hiring, ongoing supplement standing with some budget? You know, what kinds of things are Measure R funds going to be used for? That would be stated in your mission statement. Um, <clears throat> and I had a couple examples. Um, and um, this gentleman's discussion about the roofs was a perfect example. I thought of it's like a one-time expenditure to improve the facilities, make it a safer environment for not only uh, city staff, but citizens as well, and our visitors who come to Barco. Um, uh, another thing would be like a one-time expenditure for trails improvement, you know, putting all, just taking six streets. I think someone mentioned in the last meeting, why couldn't we just do all the streets at once, and then they would be maintained throughout the years and future down the, down the line, then you would, you know, maybe do some more streets. And that would be a one-time expenditure, but it would uh, have the city while we budgets to maintain and repair you know, certain things about streets and trails. So that would be uh, you know, another idea. Or um, something, an example of, say, an ongoing expenditure, maybe is, is a guiding principle to say that a certain percentage of Measure Our Funds would be 
uh, set aside, dedicated to like, the reserve fund for the city. So and that was just um, a, a thought I had about the committee and how it could move forward and make things easier or uh, you know, more structured for future committees and determining how those our funds would be used. Thank you. And our second um, speaker is Bill Naylor. chance to speak to you. I, again, I want to reiterate what I said a couple of months ago, or a couple of meetings ago, actually, that I want to thank you guys for your service. It's This is really sometimes a very thankless job to have to decide, you know, who's going to get what? Who's going to split the baby and get this half or that half? So I do really appreciate you taking the time to do this. I know you went through some real rough spots here the last couple of meetings trying to decide, well, what can we do and what can't we do and such. And I think you're getting through that and uh, going in the right direction. Again, I want to thank you for your service on that. And a lot of the things that the city staff has presented to you and you've reviewed and you've had some really good questions and you've made some really good decisions from what I can see. And I really want to thank you for that. I would like to think, go one step further, and uh, this is going to be an ongoing committee for some time to come. Uh, in the, you know, four and a half million dollars, theoretically, for what, 10 years or so, that's 45 million dollars. And in your four year term, that's maybe about $20 million that you're going to be responsible for helping with the improvements within the city. So there's quite a bit of things that you can do. and. I've listened to some of your comments. Uh, or committee member Yates there has talked about, well, she'd like to see some bang for her buck so people can see what Measure R is doing. I fully agree with that. Parks, or the Streets and Trails Commission has made a list of stuff, and you've already seen the trails that they want to do. I'd like you to think about it at midterm when you have your funding. Uh, kind of established and know for sure what you're going to have is you might even consider improving up on the trails uh, issue and uh, one of the things that I've been talking with a lot of residents and business people is they'd like to see 6th Street done. I, I was kind of uh, got them not to do 6th Street when it was originally budgeted for about two years ago because there were some other things I thought needed it more but it would be something that would be really uh, it would catch people's attention. And it also might help draw more people to the business district to spend more money. So up comes our revenue. Okay? But that's what I did. Again, thank you for your service. There are no more speaker cards. Uh, future um, agenda items. Uh, I have one. Um, this probably is more of a Brian thing. Okay, I have been getting personally emails from every single commission and committee in Norca. There's EDAC, there's um, who has things that they want done, there's the Historical Preservation Committee that wants things done, there's um, Trail Streets, there's Parks Recs. <laughs> okay, so what um, I was wondering if we could. Some, some of these are very small, like like a bathroom for the Historical Preservation Committee um, that works. And so um, just in case, at, after, at mid-year, we are making more. Could you have a list of maybe what other committees would like us to look at? Can sure. you do that? Well, we meet with our commissions, too, which would do that. So that's part of that. The, it's part the, of the big picture. The, the challenge sometimes comes is that the capital versus the maintenance. And in some cases, um, some of those would fall to the general fund under maintenance. In fact, one of the examples you just gave just came to me today. And I said, that's <coughs> not Measure R, that's over here. So we can look at that. And unfortunately, I wish they, certain things come to me before I go to budget so I can make sure that we've allocated for them. But some things are more maintenance oriented um, versus the capital side. So, okay. but what we can do, both Chad and I, um, and I talked to Roger too, is make sure that they understand what the difference is. 
And yes, some of the things that we would look at would be most certainly in the Measure R side or CIP side. Uh, but we have to, what is it? Because that sometimes is on the maintenance side versus that. But most certainly we can talk to everybody about it. And, uh, in fact, both Chad and I will be going to our commissions and uh, giving them updates of what's going on here. And that would be a perfect time to discuss that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you wanted that to come back as an agenda item? Do you, or, or is that it doesn't just need to be as an agenda item. We, just information? No. Okay. But so we can I'll report that, that we have done this, what I'll call maybe educational process with Okay. It. Thank you. So there were a couple of things that we talked about as agenda items at the last meeting that aren't on the agenda this time that seem like they would be more appropriate anyway for the next meeting when we actually have those items. So I would just like to request that we go back and look at the minutes for the information that I requested and that we ensure that that information is provided at the yeah. joint. It was on the was um, separate sheet that I gave you that it, um, that it was coming back in okay. August. So I'm, um, Not did August, you, July. or July. Did okay. you see the, um, no, it, was, it was included. Okay. So if you look at that, that'll be a tracking mechanism for all the okay. items that were voted on, the motions that were made, or requests that were made. So it'll have like when it was requested. Agenda. Correct. Okay. So if you look at that, if you want to make any changes to that or any, just let me know. Um, okay. I know Vice Chair Shaw had a few questions about it and we added, like today I will add, um, this item is not voted on for the agenda, but it's more information that needs to be provided. So we'll be tracking that so staff and myself know that things are being taken care of appropriately. Because I think that the items that I requested, I actually want them agendized mm -hmm. to ensure that we can talk about them. Yeah, so the, the ones that you uh, we voted on, you mm -hmm. did have one item that you made a motion and it was voted on and it is on that list to come oh, back. Perfect. There was more, And there was an explanation on there. Just, just to add to that, uh, and her, the, some of the items may not come back at the immediate meeting because we need to do our, but we can. And understandable. And, and because at some point we want to, and one of your items I was in our wheelhouse of stuff we worked on, I want to, we want to do a presentation and take a look at, not today, but the future as well, because I think that falls within what you were talking about. So some of those are, are have been, uh, per the CM, have been added to our workflow. And I've talked to some of my staff, and Chad does the same thing, and says, okay, we're going to work on this. This will come back to you, and that allows you guys to really discuss it and provide more information, and there may be more data that we need to go out and research on that. But as Dana said, that's going to be in our, on our work to task list. So this one says pending. I think I'd like to request, though, that we have whatever we can have for the July meeting because that's when we're going to actually be looking at our ideas and so we need to have which one is pending this? this one says additional city projects that protect the city of norco revenue stream or can improve the revenue stream so we need to have whatever we can for the next meeting if we're going to finalize our recommendations no and this one says pending we can mm -hmm. um, so are these are recommendations we can give more recommendations throughout the year and that's why i wanted tim to talk to edac because that's what they do mm -hmm. I, I still would like whatever you can at the next meeting so that yeah, it just did, and, and maybe uh, when we look at that, it's and, and not really knowing how the large that scope is, it it may take staff with everything else in our workflow more than just by your next meeting. I don't want to promise to bring you something that I can't. No, and, and what and I that's, suggested at the last meeting is that there are items that you already know, so there are simple things. Yeah, it's the easy just, thing that I said was the 6th Street fencing, because you do have that number because you were going to do it before. So, so, so I'm not it, asking for the moon. I'm just asking for whatever yeah. you do know now. Or, so some of it may be very conceptual and not reality, because we always look at ideas conceptually and some of what she's been talking about. But there is really not necessarily all of the data is available. I think we can bring you some things back, but I don't know that... We can bring, and, and I guess we can do that, and you can say, hey, well, this, we're missing this, and come back with more information. Yeah, I mean, just whatever you can. Right. I'm not asking you to do what you can't do, right. clearly, or what you can And I think, obviously, when we start to look at revenue stream type items, I have kind of a list. I can bring that back and, 
and particularly if uh, whatever you can, Brian. Right. I mean, just whatever you can, because that's going to be a critical meeting, and I would just right. appreciate that, please. What I may not have is the economic side of what the value of that would be. And so. you may not. I'm not necessarily asking you to do an ROI analysis <laughs> because that calculating ROI is a very first of all, it's subjective, right. and um, that's a whole other debate to be had. I think I would just like you to use some common sense. Sure. Common sense stuff, as our speaker said and we brought up before, that if we make our business districts look better, then potentially, potentially, we're not going to have an exact factor, but potentially we'll draw more people. Potentially, if the areas that are more that have more visitors and are potentially more touristed, then um, you know, or we have more uh, facilities or you know things that will draw more people. And if you draw more people, there are plenty of economic studies out there that tell you how many more people you have in the city. You can, you know, multiply how much they're going to spend and what that impact is to the city. So just common sense stuff, not not calculated ROI. We don't need to be in the science yet. So no. Okay. All right. <laughs> I think we just want some. You know, um, you've brought up some of the comments you brought up about, you know, fixing City Hall, that this could then have energy savings. You don't have the calculations, but everyone here, you know, could believe that that makes sense. I'm not going to speak for everyone, but I think that makes total sense. So, yes, it's just a realistic, you know, using your common sense. No, I, I, I will, we'll force some people to say such a Okay, anyone comments? All right, we're